So today I'll be talking about creating um, a lean, mean Drupal 8 theme. Uh, I don't have all the answers to your theming problems, so if you're here expecting a magic solution, this room seems really crowded. <laughs> um, but I'm going to do my best to share uh, my approach for Drupal theming. Uh, just as an introduction, my name is Suzanne Dergachova. I work at Evolving Web in Montreal. And I'm a Drupal themer, as well as a trainer, and I do some development, and I run a Drupal shop, so I wear a lot of hats. And at Evolving Web, we work for a lot of different types of clients. So we've worked for the Linux Foundation, McGill University, some other Canadian universities, and some uh, enterprise organizations. And we run a Drupal 8 training program. So if you're trying to learn Drupal 8 and weren't able to learn enough at DrupalCon, you can get in touch with us about uh, training. So today I'm going to be talking about Drupal 8 theming. Um, this applies largely to Drupal 7 theming as well. And this all comes from my experience doing theming. So I've been working on Drupal sites for probably the last seven years. Um, and I have a lot of experience with Drupal themes. And at some point you think you've seen everything. You know, you've seen lots of different sites with lots of different use cases and requirements and maybe, you know, 50 different Drupal themes that you know intimately. Um, but in the last couple years, I've come across some Drupal themes that really surprised me, that did things in, in a way that I was really shocked by. Uh, you know, themes with, with hundreds of templates and loads of CSS files and just a lot of code in the template.php file. Uh, and so uh, you, you can always learn something new. Um, and a couple of the themes that I was looking at just had so many template files and so much code, and they were using SAS and LESS and CSS all on the same site. Uh, and don't even get me started on the amount of uh, DB calls that I've seen in theme code in the last couple of years. Um, and even though Drupal 7 theming has been around for a while and, you know, you kind of think, okay, people kind of know how to do this, uh, I've seen some patterns that were really surprising me. So a couple, a couple of the themes that I looked at were themes that we were inheriting from other developers. So these are themes that maybe were written by first-time first -time themers. And the amount of code was really shocking. Um, but then when I started looking at the configuration, there was also a lot to go through. So it would take maybe days to wade through the, the views and the panels and the view modes and map it all together with a theme. And so I started to see this as a pattern amongst, uh, amongst some, some sites. Um, and it really made me question, you know, what is our approach to theming? Like what are actually the best practices for, for Drupal theming? And this is what leads me to this talk today. Um, so now that Drupal 8 is out and we're working on sites using Drupal 8 theming, uh, and maybe some of us are working on upgrades, um, it's a really good chance for us to reassess how we do theming and to maybe look for a more minimalist approach to how we do things. Um, and this pr approach is probably going to be different for everyone. So this, this session today, I'm not going to be giving you like a clear solution to how to make Drupal 8 themes. I know Morton did a talk yesterday on, uh, what was it called again? How Drupal 8 themes, like how do we do this? Uh, and, um, and so I, like, like him, like I don't have an exact approach that I'm going to tell you. But basically, I'm just going to be discussing some, some ideas in the approach that I use. Um, and give you some, some food for thought. Um, and there are some clear like do's and don'ts that I have, um, but basically the approach is pretty flexible. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about why Drupal 8 themes are complex to begin with, or why Drupal themes in, in general are complex. Uh, where does this complexity come from? Uh, I'm going to be looking through our tool set as themers and going through uh, best practices for, for using that tool set. And then I'm going to talk about limiting the complexity uh, just by following some basic guidelines. 
So no matter what, what approach you're using, uh, these are some things that you can, you can adopt into your theming process. So first off, where does the complexity come from? I think it comes from uh, a lot of places, but three main things. First of all, Drupal theming is really flexible, so that allows us to create something really complex. Secondly, we have a lot of configuration that integrates with the theme, so there's a lot of dependencies back and forth there. Um, and finally, we also are, as themers, implementing a design, and so sometimes that complexity just we inherit from the design process. So the design process is really messy, and then of course the theme is this, this behemoth thing. Um, I had a client once who asked me to make a theme that looked like an art deco building. It was a few years ago. I, I didn't have the courage to say no, so I, I tried to implement that. Um, another time, uh, also several years ago, I was implementing a site that basically had been designed for Flash, so it was a fixed height, uh, and it had all these characteristics that were kind of Flash-like, and again, I didn't really have the courage to say no. I said, yeah, of course Drupal can do that, and I think as themers, we often want to say that. We want to say, of course Drupal can do this, like, it's, it's Drupal, it's so flexible. Um, and so when we get handed a design, uh, sometimes we see the need to do things uh, with our theme. So, so we might get given a design that has a lot of different layouts. And we think, oh, can we, can we do this in Drupal? Well, of course, we have templates that we can use to override the markup. And if we don't have enough templates in Drupal core that we can you know, override, we can, um, we can start adding we can start using template suggestions. And then if that's not enough, we can actually add additional template suggestions in our theme so we can add even more templates. And this is how you wind up getting a theme with hundreds of templates. Uh, and I think th this is a, a list of all the templates. I know it's really tiny because I had to zoom out really far so you could see them all, but these are all the templates that are used for a theme that I was recently working on. Um, and that's not even all the templates. You know, you have to open up the views folder there at the beginning, there's a whole slew of views templates as well. Um, and, you know, Drupal complains when you uh, have modules on your site that are out of date, right? You get a little error message to tell you your modules are out of date. But there's no error message that pops up when you've added 200 templates to your theme. Maybe there should be, I don't know. Um, we also, often as themers, get asked to implement different display logics, right? So you'll be implementing a website for a university and you have program pages and you're supposed to embed all the course information on the program page. And you say, yeah, of course we can do this in the theme, we have pre-process functions. And you can also use these to uh, insert icons or embed a node queue or embed a view. Or maybe you wanna embed a view inside another view and you say, yeah, of course we can do this. We're Drupal themers, we can do anything. Uh, we have pre-process functions. So you, you start adding thousands and thousands of lines of code in your pre-process functions because the Drupal theme system is really flexible. Some sites you might work on have a really clear design process where you start off with a nice style guide and you have all these general style uh, characteristics that you implement um, and it's a really organized design process. But sometimes you're working with a, a design that's put together um, that's very specific. So you might be implementing basically a, a brochure as a website. And sometimes this is obvious for a really tiny, tiny website, but even for larger websites, sometimes we'll, we'll end up with pages and pages of mockups that are really specific. And it's hard as a themer to know kind of at what level we're doing our theming. Are we theming the HTML on the page or are we theming the HTML on this specific page with this specific set of content? Um, and so sometimes when we get designs that are really specific, like over here I have some samples, a corporate website with a lot of really specific marketing material, a tourist brochure for uh, Tourism Quebec, uh, and a comic book website that's designed to be like a, a comic book. 
And in these cases, we might end up writing tons of CSS and JavaScript. And even if we're using SAS and we think we're all being modern, like, oh, SAS, uh, we're still writing loads of more CSS than we really should be. Um, and so here's some samples from a, a SAS, of SAS from a theme that I was working on. Um, and the reason it's so specific is that it's controlling for the height of some of the elements on the page. Uh, it's controlling for um, really specific blocks that are uh, displaying, you know, uh, quick tabs, and inside the quick tabs you have views. And it's not just trying to, to control the display of quick tabs and blocks in general, it's really going for these specific cases on these specific pages. So if all we had in our toolkit as themers was the theme, I think things wouldn't be so bad. You know, there's a lot of complexity in the code, but we can deal with it. It's all in code. But Drupal, of course, doesn't work like that. We have all kinds of modules that we can use. And sometimes we use modules to control the layout and the display of our content. And, and that's because sometimes we don't want to hard code everything in the theme, right? We want to make things flexible. We want to let site builders come and extend the site. Uh, sometimes we use modules because it's faster than putting everything in the theme, you know? Using panels, it helps you quickly uh, prototype new landing pages. Um, and sometimes we just think a new module is cool and we want to use it because it's there and why wouldn't you use it? Um, but using uh, modules to control the display and layout of your pages can add to the complexity. And then you end up with dependencies between your configuration and your theme. So a lot of the times when you're, when you're building a site, you have the option to integrate something in the theme or to use configuration. So for example, if you're trying to add a byline to uh, a blog page uh, just below the page title, you could do this just in your theme. You could add a variable to the block template um, and then print it out in the template, define it in your, in your .theme file or in your template.php file, or you could create a view. So you could create a view that displays the page title and the byline and print that out at the top of every page. So in a lot of cases, you have this option. Do you use a view or do you just do it in the theme? Sometimes you need to group fields together, right? You'll, you'll have a, a site like this where you're displaying an event and you need to list a bunch of dates and maybe some locations. And you could group these together just using a, a template file. Or you could do it purely in configuration using field collections. So again, you have this choice. You might do it one way, another themer might do it another. Uh, and even on a single site, you might have some cases where you're using field collections and some cases when you're not. One thing we often have to do in the theme is to display content in various ways throughout the site. And so a really good method of doing this is using view modes, right? So you think, okay, great, there's a, a method for this in Drupal, we have view modes. Um, but you could do it using view modes and you could change the display of the content just using a template or you could use uh, views to do this, and you could configure the display, the fields in the view, um, or you could just purely use view modes and customize the display uh, of the fields using the manage display tab. So even just for something that seems simple, we have these three options for either using theming or using configuration or using a combination of the two. Often in our themes, we want to display different types of layouts. Uh, and some themers will do this just in the theme. They'll set up their regions and configure, configure uh, the blocks or allow a site builder to configure the blocks. But sometimes we decide we want to use something like panels or display suite and be able to more quickly configure these types of changes. So on top of our theme, we have all this all this configuration that adds a layer of complexity. And if that wasn't enough, so that's kind of two things we're managing. And then we have designers or, you know, the design process. Is anyone here a designer? Yeah, awesome. Designers who know Drupal, this is great. 
Um, not all designers know Drupal, not all designers know content management systems, and not all designers kind of take into account the, the need for consistency in content architecture. And so sometimes you run into a design process that makes the, the theme more complex. So how does it do that? So first of all, we have designers uh, who are very good at creating variations of things. If you're using a wireframing tool or Photoshop or Illustrator, it's really easy to copy paste and just create a bunch of landing pages that are all very distinct. So a more concrete example in the slides here, um, a designer could create many different variations of buttons on your site for no particular reason. And this actually comes from uh, evolvingweb.ca, from our simple corporate website. It's not a very complicated website, and yet for some reason there's this many variations of button styles. So you can just imagine how many button styles you're gonna end up with on a, on a larger site. You might end up with a site that has lots of fancy layouts. Um, every page might have a layout that's slightly different, or you might end up with unique landing pages that have, have different layouts. Or sometimes sites want to have different layouts for the same content. You know, you're creating uh, a page and you have three options for how that content's going to be laid out on the page. Um, or sometimes you'll get specs where the design or styling of a page is attached to the content. So a specific page on the site will need to implement a, a specific uh, color scheme or branding. Or maybe that is attached to a certain menu item or a menu dropdown. And of course, it's possible to do this in Drupal, right? You can create pages where the, the theme takes into account the, the page that you're looking at and the design changes, um, but this can easily get out of hand, um, and the designer might not realize that they're having this impact on the maintainability of your theme. So here's an example of some landing pages that we implemented, and the initial designs had a lot more variation than this. Here you can see there's, there's a few blocks being displayed in the, in the layouts, and uh, you, know, you can have a black background or a light background. They could be left or right aligned. You can add uh, calls to action and, and videos to these landing page blocks. Um, but the initial designs had way more iteration, way, way more variation in terms of these, these blocks. And it was something that would have been impossible to theme in a Drupal way. We would have had to add CSS and HTML specific to each landing page. So by making the, the design more consistent, we were able to have an implementation that was a lot more flexible. So now when the site authors create new landing page blocks, they just have to select whether they want a light background or dark background, whether they want it to be left aligned or right aligned. So by simplifying the design, we simplified the theme significantly. So we have a really flexible theme system in Drupal, a lot of powerful configuration, and a design process that sometimes dictates um, the branding of the site, uh, and this isn't even a complete picture. It's kind of a simplified version. I'm probably missing some, some arrows here, and I'm definitely missing a lot of components, uh, but you can see that obviously there's this complex uh, relationship between theming and configuration, and then the design of your site is just, is just adding to this. Okay, so I've painted this, this terrible picture. You're all gonna have nightmares about landing page designs and other terrible things. Um, but, you know, Drupal 8 just came out, and this is gonna solve all our problems, right? Right, okay, so presentation's over. Use Drupal 8. You're all good. Drupal 8 theming. So I'm sure you've all been going to all the front-end sessions on Drupal 8 theming, all the new tools we have, um, and you're all excited to get started and, and build more Drupal 8 themes. So now with Drupal 8, we have, we have libraries for loading CSS and JavaScript, we have Twig templating, we have more templates than we did before. We used to have more, more theme functions, but, but now everything we can override with templates. Um, we have these new core base themes, classy and, and stable, and we have breakpoints. And there's lots of improvements just in using the Drupal 8 theme system. So if you're looking to kind of create a more minimalist theme, 
maybe by default our themes will just be more minimalist. So we have no JavaScript loaded by default on the front end in Drupal 8. Uh, we have this max style or, or categorization of our CSS files, which is, which is really great that we can just start using. Um, we have HTML5 markup by default. We have the stable theme, which is a more minimalistic theme because it's not adding so many classes. We have better accessibility. So if you look into Drupal 8 accessibility, if this is important to you, you know, you just get a lot more out of the box. And decoupled Drupal is possible, so you can create something truly uh, minimalist. Does that mean that Drupal 8's solving all our theming problems? No, because we still have all of these tools that we can use as themers, and when we're making our custom themes, we can still make things really complex. So I'm gonna go through some of these tools that we have. Some of them are new, some of them we had in, in Drupal 7, um, and I'm just gonna talk about best practices for some of these things. So first of all, with Drupal 8, we have these two core themes, stable and classy. And you might, if you've heard of these themes, you know that the stable theme, it's more uh, simplistic. It doesn't have so many classes that it adds. It's, um, it's um, you know, stable. <laughs> it, the, the reason it's called stable, right, is because it's not, changing, so in Drupal 8, the core markup could change, but the markup in the stable theme is, is stable. Uh, classy is called classy because it has more classes, so you can see the difference between these two template files. The classy theme adds, adds all this stuff to the top. So you might, you might be thinking, oh great, this is a way to make my theme more minimalistic, I'll just use the stable theme, it's more simple. Um, but if you're using stable, you might be missing some of these classes that we used to use in Drupal 7, like having a class for whether or not the user is logged in, or having a class for the, the language that your site is in. These things can be really useful. So if you do use stable, you might find that you add a lot of extra templates to get the, those classes back, because you specifically want a certain class. Um, and if you have to copy a template into your theme, um, to, to customize it, that's adding to the amount of code that you have to maintain. So if you do find yourself doing that, then I would say go for the classy theme. I think it's more appropriate for most theme developers, um, but choose the one that's gonna work best for you and for your design process. Next up, libraries. So we have libraries in, in Drupal 8. How many of you have used libraries in your themes so far? A couple of you, okay. So for those of you who haven't used libraries, the uh, YAML file, or the info, the, sorry, the libraries.yaml file in your theme allows you to define libraries. And when these libraries are attached to a page, the CSS and JavaScript associated the library, with the library will get loaded. So typically, you'll have uh, a global library that's attached in your info.yaml file, and this will get loaded on every page that's themed with your theme. On the other hand, if you have CSS and JavaScript that you only want to load in specific cases, um, you'll probably attach the library in a template file, like this. Like if you only want to attach your search styling library when the search page is, is loaded, you could attach it to the page search template. You could also attach libraries using a preprocess function or using a page attachments alter uh, function in your, in your theme. So you can kind of control when these libraries get loaded and how they're used. So this is a replacement for Drupal add JS, Drupal add CSS. Now we have libraries which give us more control. So this is an exciting new tool. It helps, it's gonna help us define um, our CSS and JavaScript into these more distinct groups and have more control over how it's loaded on the page. But because it's a new tool, we're probably all gonna use it way too much. So there are really good use cases for using libraries. It's obvious that you're gonna have a global 
a global library of some sort. It might be useful to have a library for something like the search section of your site, where you have a lot of specific styling for search filters and search results, or for a store section of your site, where you have uh, all your e-commerce listings and CSS specific to, to those pages. But it's also tempting to create too many libraries. So the first Drupal 8 site I worked on, the first theme I was, I was working on, um, I started creating libraries for everything just because they were there. Um, and if you find yourself creating libraries for things like the front page, all your landing pages, your user profile pages, there's probably a lot of overlap between the CSS and JavaScript you're gonna use in these pages, and you might just find yourself writing more CSS than you otherwise would need to. Um, so keep that in mind, and, uh, and don't use libraries if you don't have a specific need to. Um, another thing to keep in mind with libraries if you're adding CSS is that the fact that you're using a, a library means that you're already in the context of a certain section of your site, right? If you're adding a, a search library to your theme, then you know that that library is only gonna get loaded on search pages. So there's no reason for you to go and add uh, a selector in your CSS that targets search pages. You don't need to wrap all of your SAS in a selector for the search page because you're already in that context. So this, this uh, use of of contextual libraries allows us to simplify our CSS, so you should take advantage of that. Uh, one of the main things we do as themers is write CSS or, or SAS, or you might use less, um, to define the look and feel of the site. Um, but it's easy to write CSS that's overly complicated, especially if you're using a preprocessor like SAS. So writing good SAS is important. So even more important than if you're just writing CSS where you're probably aware things are complex, it's easy to write SAS that's overly complicated without realizing it. So one, a few rules of thumb here. First thing, uh, don't nest your selectors when you don't have to. So if you're creating uh, a whole bunch of pages on your site and you have a bunch of uh, events views all over the place in blocks and on pages. Don't nest all the CSS for your events view inside the CSS for one of your blocks because then that CSS is only going to apply to the events view that shows up in that block. Instead, it's better to create more generic CSS first um, and then go and override the specific uh, cases where, where you need to. Don't use IDs if you can at all avoid it. So as soon as you use an ID, you're creating something that can't be reused. So something like adding CSS for uh, a specific block with a certain ID, rather than adding a class to that block, uh, it's something to definitely avoid. Same thing with our views or anything else you might want to reuse. With SAS, we have uh, variables. And it's important to name your variables and use your variables consistently. So if you have variables and the names kind of don't make sense, it's gonna be really hard for the next themer to come along and figure out what you meant. And you know, this could be a whole presentation on best practices for SAS. So uh, I'll leave you with the advice that you should review your CSS after SAS creates it um, because it'll help you figure out how your SAS could be, could be simplified more. So if you're looking through the CSS that's generated and you find more complexity than you expected and you don't really understand why there's so, so many complicated selectors, then you can go back and review your SAS to fix that. And there's a link here, uh, the slides will be online with uh, more useful suggestions. So Drupal 8 gives us more templates than ever before to customize. Um, and instead of theme functions in Drupal 8, we have just more template files, right? So for something like theming the breadcrumbs, you don't use a function anymore. You have a template to override the output of the breadcrumbs. So 
So this is, this is great that we have a more consistent way of doing things. We actually have kind of one less tool in the theming toolkit. But the question still remains how to make templates that are maintainable. So my first piece of advice would be just don't create so many templates. If you can avoid it, uh, your theme will be more maintainable if you just have fewer files to maintain. So if you're creating a simple theme that's um, extending something like Classy, or if you're using a base theme like uh, boot, Bootstrap, you might not need to create so many template files. If you do start creating template files, you're using Twig now, right? Drupal 8 has, um, has Twig, which is one of the exciting things as themers that we get to use. And one of the features that Twig comes with is Twig blocks. How many of you have used Twig blocks before? A couple people. How many of you have heard of Twig blocks? A few more. Okay, so Twig blocks are not like Drupal blocks at all. Twig blocks are their their own thing. Um, and I don't know if you can tell really well in this example. Hopefully, you can at least see this. But in in a Twig template, you might find a chunk of code that defines a block. And a block is something that you can override in a child template. So say in your node template, you have a, a Twig block. It's going to be a section of the template file. Um, in your node article template, you could decide that instead of overriding the whole template, you just want to override that one block. And so this is great, right? Because usually when we override a template, it's just to override one part of the template. If you're overriding the page template, for example, you probably don't want to change everything around. You just want to go and add one variable to the home page, or you just want to change around one thing on a landing page. Um, and so uh, by extending templates, so you see in the node article template there, we're extending the parent template, the node.html.twig file, and we're just overriding the, the node header block. So that's that one chunk of code from the parent template. And so this allows you to create template files that have less code in them and that are easier to maintain. So this, this seems like a great thing, and I think it's, you know, this exists in a lot of other frameworks. When I started theming, I was using um, Ruby on Rails, and it had this a similar system of, of partials, and it made templating a lot more fun. Um, but at the same time, every time you're doing this, creating a child template, it's still a new template, so it's still something that you're adding to the theme. Um, and one downside is that it removes some of the uh, context. So if you open up the node article template and all you see is this one node header block that's being overridden, you lose the context for what's around that block. So I would say with this twig block tool that we have, it's going to be really great, but it's going to require some more thought and maybe adding comments to describe why we have a, a node header block in our, our template um, and why we're overriding it. These things will be useful. One other thing to keep in mind when you're, when you're overriding templates, especially uh, with node templates, is that you as a themer, when you're adding a template, you're taking responsibility for all the output that that template prints on the page. So if it's a node template, what's the node template's main job? It's to print out the content of the node. I have seen so many node templates in Drupal 7 themes that don't print out the content. Uh, they just print out all the fields that they want to print and in what or, at whatever order they want. Uh, so with, with Drupal 8, just like with Drupal 7, we have to print things out in our Twig templates. So this is the syntax here for, um, the, for printing things in Twig, this double curly bracket syntax. And so here we're printing out the links from the content. Then we're printing out content without the links, and then we're printing out the links again. Um, and so printing out the content, that second line, that's really important. You shouldn't leave that out of your template files. Even if at the, the time all of your content's being displayed, a site builder might come along later and add a field 
to your content type, and if you don't print out the content, you just print out all the individual fields, you'll be missing that, that extra thing. So there's no p twig police that's gonna come along and stop you from adding a template where you're not displaying the content, but just have to take responsibility and make sure you do it. So pre-process functions are still a tool in our Drupal 8 theming toolkit, and they allow us to customize display logic on our site, so we can add variables, we can, we can change almost anything using a pre-process function. And there's lots of good use cases for this. So sometimes you want to combine two fields together or add a variable, um, change the format of, of something. Um, and these are all really good reasons to use a preprocess function. But there's also lots of examples of people using preprocess functions in kind of ugly ways. So if, you're, if you find that you're formatting field types again and again in your preprocess functions, the same fields over and over again, better just to use a, a module for that, create a, a formatter. Um, I've also seen in preprocess functions people overriding um, or people uh, creating logic around a certain node ID. So changing everything about how a node is displayed just for that one node ID. And this is something that we shouldn't do anywhere in our code if we can avoid it because it creates a dependency on our content. So if anyone ever deletes that node, then our, our whole theme kind of falls apart. Um, also, just obvious things, maybe database calls in our, in our preprocess functions or uh, calculations for currencies. These are things that are too complex for the theme layer. At some point, we need to pass that responsibility on to a, a custom module. As themers, we often face this dilemma of whether to put something in a preprocess function or whether to override a template instead. And I think there's no hard and fast rules here. Some people like adding templates and some people prefer preprocess functions. But in general, if you're adding logic, if you're creating variables, um, preprocess functions are really good for that. If you're just changing the markup a bit or adding some classes, um, you, can, you can do that in a template file. So view modes I talked about a little bit before. Um, there are ways of changing the display of content for different contexts on our site. And adding view modes in Drupal 8 is easier than ever before. How many of you use Display Suite for Drupal 7? So we still have Display Suite for Drupal 8, but for Drupal, um, for Drupal 8, view modes are in core. So you don't have to use Display Suite if all you want are these extra view modes for your content types. Um, and they work for content types, but also for other things in Drupal, other entities. Um, and so view modes are a really useful tool that I think people are going to use more because they are in core, uh, or the ability to create them in the UI is in core, I should say. In Drupal 7, you could create them, um, but you had to write some code. Um, but I think sometimes they're used too much. So if you are using view modes, and in each of your node templates, you have a switch that changes the whole output of the node for each view mode, you're probably writing too much code. So if you already have view modes, then you have the ability to change the field display for each view mode for each, uh, for each type of content or for each uh, bundle on your site. And so writing all this extra code in your theme is kind of adding a second layer of, of complexity. Um, if you end up with situations where you're, you have one view mode that's just for one content type and that's only used in one place, that's also probably a, a sign that you're adding too much complexity, using too many view modes. Okay, theme settings. I think this is something that um, a, a kind of a tool that themers forget about. We have theme settings in contributed modules for changing things like colors and um, the, the layout of our, our theme. Um, but theme settings are something that we can use in our own custom themes as well. So if you have a theme, for example, that's gonna be installed in a bunch of different places, maybe you have a university uh, 
a set of university websites and the branding needs to be the same, but you have some slight variations in look and feel, theme settings would be uh, great for this use case because it means you can have a, a single theme and then you can just use the theme settings to switch between the small branding variations. So for one, uh, for one instance of the website, maybe you wanna have a logo or a slightly taller banner or a slightly different uh, color scheme. So you can just use theme settings to change this and then you only have one theme to maintain. So trust me, if you're, um, if you're trying to create a minimalist theme, the worst thing you can do is say, okay, my theme's really minimalist. Now I'm going to copy and paste it and have two separate themes. This is like the opposite of what you wanna do, right? Even creating multiple sub-themes, uh, you're still gonna end up with a, a lot of code to maintain. Okay, the last uh, tool that I'm gonna talk about here today are regions, and this is gonna seem really basic for a lot of you. You think, of course, I've made so many Drupal themes, and you're talking to me about regions. So basic. Um, but I don't think I've ever come across a Drupal theme that I've inherited from another developer, or I don't think I've even ever made a Drupal theme where the theme, the, the regions in the theme actually match up to the exact regions that I need on the site. So there always seems to be some extra ghost region that nobody, you know, nobody knows what it's for, nobody knows why it's there. Like there's a sidebar second that has no blocks in it that nobody seems to know why we have this sidebar second. And one day the site builder decides to put a block in there and maybe it shows up, maybe it doesn't, maybe it kind of shows up randomly in the middle of the page. Um, so with regions, just, you know, just make sure the regions actually match up with the, the regions that you have printed out in your, in your template and the ones that you're using. So to sum up, um, your mission as a themer is to limit the complexity of the theme. So it's kind of up to you. You have all these forces, the, the design, you have all the excitement about Drupal 8, you have configuration that you're, you're putting together and you have your, your custom theme. And so it's hard to be the themer and to, to deal with all these different things. So just some words of advice. First of all, be consistent. So just try and kind of choose a method and stick with it. If you're gonna use view modes for everything, go with it. Document them um, and, and name them well. If you're using a bootstrap theme, use bootstrap for all your layouts. Don't switch between different techniques for your layouts. Recognize complexity. So if you're, um, if you're working on your theme and you realize you're adding a lot of theme settings, but you're only planning to install this theme in one place. That's probably a sign that your theme is too complex. Or if you have a library that you're creating for every single page on the site, too complex. So take a step back every once in a while and just, just recognize that complexity. Think about how hard the site is gonna be to maintain. So even if it's your site, you know, you're planning on maintaining this for the next five years and you know you're the one who's gonna be there. Um, even if it's just for your future self, uh, make sure that you think about the, the maintenance task that you're adding when you add new components to your theme. So keep in mind that you're not gonna remember what you did in that, um, in that theme file two years from now. You're not gonna remember how you structured the SAS variables or um, why you called the regions what you called them. So that's why documentation is important, even if it's just for your future self. And I know, you know everybody's gonna say, write documentation, and no one's ever gonna really take the time to write it, but at least just document the things that are outliers. So if there's a region that doesn't get displayed on every page, just document that. Don't document the rest of them, just the one that's sort of special. Or if there's the pre-process functions that are really complicated, just document those. Or just the templates that uh, do something a little different. 
um, or if you have contextual libraries, just note down why you added them. So it's not to say that you have to document every single little obvious thing on your site, but just the things that you think are a little bit special. And finally, if, if you have the chance and you come across one of these mammoth themes that has 200 templates, um, maybe rather than taking on that project and all that responsibility, um, it might be worth considering refactoring the theme. So if you do decide to refactor a theme that you think has become too complex, um, there's lots of tools out there, and you've probably heard of them at other front end sessions, tools for, for testing the front end. Um, so one that we've developed at Evolving Web is called Site Diff, and it'll show you the difference between, between two sites. It'll show you the difference between the HTML. So if you've done um, a bunch of work to refactor your theme, but you don't actually want to change any of the markup that's being displayed, you can use that tool to check what has changed. There's also lots of visual diff tools that will create screenshots of your site in different states. So you can test, okay, I refactored um, all the preprocess functions to simplify them. Now I just want to make sure they still work so you can see if anything's changed visually on the site. So um, that's all I have. If you want to learn more about Drupal 8 theming, we have all these uh, trainings that we do. And other than that, I will leave it to questions. Any questions or comments? Um, that's a good question. Should we use panels? Um, we could have a whole debate on that between panels and context and other front end tools. Um, there's definitely, like, panels definitely adds complexity because it's not just a tool for changing the layout of the page, it also adds a, a bunch of functionality. Um, so if you are just using it to create layouts, um, unless you need to give the administrator control over that, those layouts and you need to be able to change them on the fly, I think it can be overkill. So we've created lots of sites just using uh, context where we have landing pages. Yeah, I, th I mean, I think in general it's a, it's a good approach uh, with, for Drupal 8 as well, yeah. Yeah. I just have a, a, a quick clearing thing up in Drupal 8. The, uh, the fear of having a lot of files is, is way less. It's actually how we end up designing the system. Um, so um, don't be too afraid of it. Uh, there is at least 140 files no matter what you do. Because that's <laughs> how it's built. Uh, but you can hide it all away by going with the base theme. It's just the files are still there so you can hide them from yourself visually. Um, but they're still there. I just want to make sure that kind of, kind of one of the pet things we must in. Um, we have actually been thinking about removing pre process That has been a, a wish um, in the way we would think Drupal 8. It's not sure if we're going to, no, probably not going to happen anyways, but again, to remove, reduce the uh, complexity of the session. And besides that, thanks for a good presentation. I get so happy when I see these things happening. <laughs> thanks. 
just want, I was wondering how you take uh, site performance into consideration when you're making some of these decisions. Uh, for example, I'm on a D7 site now where I use um, display suite in as a display mode for search results, but then the way w that we configured search made those pages load like 10 seconds plus. It, it's crazy. Um, okay. So now we're trying to work around that. So <laughs> what, are, what do you use, um, or what are some things you do to kind of take performance into consideration with your decisions that you make? Oh, good question. Um, so I don't, I don't know that much about performance. Uh, <laughs> I work with a team of developers who's, I sort of hand that over to them. Yeah, maybe uh, a better a question time. might, might be, um, how do you work your, with your development team um, to find those things out? Is that like suggestions that they give yeah. you? Yeah, like, so yeah, that? that is a great question. So um, when we recently upgraded our own site to, to Drupal 8, it's a multilingual site, so it has content in, in English and French, and we realized after we launched the site that um, an incredible amount of time was being taken to determine the block visibility for each block on the page. And a lot of that was because there were so many blocks and we ended up having an English block and a French block for each of our blocks just because of the way we had migrated in the content. So that's something we didn't realize until after we had launched the site. So we, had, we have to go back now and kind of reconfigure all of that. So that's kind of not a good case so it's like a worst case scenario. We've already launched. We have to redo a bunch of our content. So I'd say just make, making sure that that's not the last thing, you, not the last step, but rather like one of the first parts of your QA because it's not that hard to, to just run some performance tests. Right. Um, thanks. And this is related kind of, and I almost wouldn't ask it because he's asking about performance, but um, when you're deciding whether to add a library to a page. Um, I have this old philosophy in my head, and maybe it's, I don't know if it's current, we can have a debate, but that I should put all the same JavaScript and CSS on every page load so that it gets cached by the user's browser. But if I'm adding different things for different pages, and that's not happening, I can see how it makes the theming easier, but, but is there a danger in the long run of, I don't know, of the Having too many um, of, of, components loaded? Risk? of the performance risk of doing that a lot? Um, I, I don't think it's uh, something you have to be too concerned about. So there's, there's grouping of CSS files for Drupal 8. So um, that's going to help a lot with the, the aggregation. So it's not just going to aggregate each of your libraries separately. Yep. Thank you so much for putting this together. Um, you mentioned field collection for grouping fields. Um, Drupal 7 also has multi-field. So I'm wondering in Drupal 8, what is like the optimal way for grouping fields? So Drupal 8, there's already a release for um, field collections. I don't know that there's any alternative. So I would start with that. Yep. Okay. Thank you. And thanks for representing women. Oh, you're welcome. My pleasure. Anyone else? One more thing about the performance, I just realized my colleagues are presenting tomorrow on um, blackfire.io, which is a performance profiling tool that's really useful for a front end. So if you're interested in front end performance, that's something to check out. Hi, I have a question about uh, sub themes. You know, once we have a multi site installation, we have to manage a lot of sub themes. So do you have any suggestions like a do's and don'ts when we are trying to have a parent theme and then a bunch of uh, child themes under the same installation? Oh, good question. So for sub-themes, um, I guess most of my experience with, with that would be coming again from um, the university context, starting out with a base theme that's shared by all university departments and then, you know, Departments that think they're special, like alumni or, um, I don't know, the admissions office, they think they deserve their own sub-theme. Um, so my suggestion would be to try and figure out this, just at least the overall architecture first. So if you have good examples of what generic sites are going to look like, 
like in that use case, if you have all these generic departments that don't have any special requirements, get a few examples of those first and build that base theme and then try and work on the sites that are special, like the admission site or the alumni site, um, and, and work on, on those um, next. Um, in my experience, if you start off with kind of the special people who think they need a special theme, and then you try and work backwards to create the base theme afterwards, that, that's a really hard thing to do. So I don't know if it's that useful, but uh, at least try and go in that top-down direction. Anything else? So for those of you who've stuck around to the end, you must really like my presentation. Uh, <laughs> so I'm gonna ask you to come to Drupal North. We're having a Drupal camp up in Montreal, June 16th to 19th. It's gonna be really fun. Montreal is amazing in, in June. We have no snow, there's lots of festivals, kinda like New Orleans. So come on up um, and join us and you can go to drupalnorth.org to, to check it out. It's free. It's That's for the training. You don't have to come to the training. The sessions are free. Awesome. Thanks, everyone.